Hello class, in this video lecture uh, we're going to be talking about AP level lab reports. That is to say, uh, we're going to give you a quick tutorial about uh, what I'm expecting and uh, the kinds of objectives you need to meet when you're writing lab reports. In AP Biology, uh, laboratory investigations as well as lab reports are vital to the learning experience. Uh, what I mean by that are labs themselves uh, help build science skills. Uh, and as well as bio biological content knowledge through inductive uh, experimental learning. And what I mean by inductive, uh, I may have mentioned this before, but from a particular example, one experience for yourself, um, that is to say the lab or the data that you get in the lab, you can then extrapolate that outwards to describe a larger trend. That is to say, our labs represent larger trends in biology, okay? And it's also, I said it's experimental, which means that you get to do it. It's sort of hands-on and, as we've mentioned in the past, inquiry-based, all right? So let's talk about what we're looking for uh, in labs. Labs are also important uh, because they build communication skills. They build writing skills uh, in a particular domain. Now, that is to say, uh, science writing or bio biological writing is different than English writing, uh, and it's important to build skills in both the English domain as well as the science or the bio biology domain. Finally, lab reports are important because uh, they are a documentation of your AP Biology experience. Many colleges increasingly now ask when you take an AP class, let's see your uh, laboratory notebook. Let's see a portfolio of the work that you've completed. Well, when we do labs uh, in, in class, that, uh, that will represent your por portfolio. All right, <laughs> I didn't realize I put this slide on here, but this tells you the purposes of lab reports as they are applied to our class. Again, they help build science skills and content. Uh, knowledge through inductive experiential learning. They uh, also help develop your writing skills in biology, and they document your experience and create a portfolio. In any lab report that you're going to write for me uh, in this class this year, uh, every lab report will have uh, at least five sections, and we can actually throw in uh, a half section more because uh, that'll be your title. You'll have every lab report will have a title. It will have an introduction, a materials and methods section, a results section, uh, or we can call that a data section. Uh, we, and then the fourth section would be a conclusion or discussion. And finally, we're going to call that last section your references section. In the next few slides, I'll just go over uh, some of the uh, criteria that I'm looking for uh, when you write each section. Before we talk about the introduction, let's actually quickly talk about that title that I mentioned earlier. Okay, in your title, in the title of any of the, uh, the labs or the, the experiments that we do, um, your title will start the effect of, and you're going to put your, the name of the independent variable on, and you're on the, after that you're going to put the name of the dependent variable. And we'll be talking about uh, independent and dependent variables as we move forward. So, for example, it might be the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis, or the effect of surface area on the rate of diffusion or osmosis, for example. Okay, so that will be your title. Since most of our labs will be controlled experiments testing the effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable, this is the uh, design that I would like your title to take. Okay, so let's talk about the introduction then. Uh, the first thing, uh, the first part of your introduction, that is to say the first sentence of your introduction will be what we call a purpose statement. Why are we doing this lab? Well, we are doing this lab to test or you'd say the purpose of this lab is to test, and hey look, the, you, you're testing the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. In fact, uh, when you create your title, your title will in large part uh, uh, be used in your purpose statement. All right? in, many, in some ways they are one and the same kind of statement. Okay, that's your purpose statement. Uh, next you'll write your hypothesis, and uh, there will be a um, a video lecture describing exactly what I'm looking for when you're writing hypotheses. 
Uh, and so you're, you'll include a hypothesis. So you'll have a purpose statement and a hypothesis. But we have to remember that a hypothesis isn't just a guess, and it's not just a wild guess. It's a guess that's based in fact. It's a, uh, it's a guess uh, or it's a prediction uh, that has some information uh, that backs it up. In fact, there is background information that causes you to make the prediction you make. All right, from what you already know, from your prior knowledge or your background experience, you will include. You will then make a, a an educated prediction. That is to say, your prediction. You should almost already know that your prediction will come to fruition, because of all of the background information that you know. As a result, you will describe and uh, let the reader know that your hypothesis is based in scientific. Uh, observation and fact. So the third part of your introduction is your background information. We also can call that the literature review. What I mean by literature review is the fact that uh, in your uh, background information you're going to be citing uh, scientists and other authors and other books. Uh, the information that you provide, none of it will be your own. All, right? All of the information that you provide in the background information will come from some source. All right, some book, some article, uh, maybe a video that I show you, or some notes in class. All of those things will inform your hypothesis. That is to say, every statement you make about background information must be backed up from some author, or some book, or some video. And you'll cite all of those things. And we'll talk about how to do that just in a second. After you have uh, written all of your background information that supports why you make the, the hypothesis or the prediction that you did, uh, then that wraps up your introduction and you're ready to move forward in your lab report. Which brings us to our materials and methods section. Uh, your, uh, because of your hypothesis, the, the, depending on the hypothesis that you generate, there will be an experiment that we design or you design to test that hypothesis. That experiment must then be described. It must be explained exactly how you perform that experiment or that investigation. That is to say, tell me what you're using to perform uh, that experiment and what you do step by step in paragraph form. All of this is in paragraph form. Okay, so the, the question is, what did you use to test your hypothesis? And what did you do to test your hypothesis? And finally, when you analyze your results, how did you do so? Did you use statistics? statistics? Or did you compare averages? Did you use a t-test or a chi-square analysis? Tell me what you did uh, and how you did it. We're not reporting anything yet. You're just describing what you did. The sign of a quality materials and methods section is this. If an outside observer, if an, uh, a non-scientist, for example, a non-teacher even, if one of your friends who's not taking this class reads your lab, uh, your lab report, reads your materials and methods section, they should be able to uh, repeat, replicate exactly what you performed, and you sh they should find uh, that they receive or they uh, discover the same results and the same conclusions. They should perform the experiment exactly as you did, and they should see the same things. All right? That is to say, your experiment or your description of your experiment must be replicable or repeatable, exactly repeatable. So after you write your materials and methods section, you should reread that section and ask yourself, can I repeat this experiment or could somebody else repeat, repeat this experiment exactly? If, if that's true, then you've written a good materials and methods section, and you're ready to move on. After your materials and methods section, uh, or that is to say, after you've described what you did to perform your experiment, uh, the next section would be the results, or the data section, which asks the question, what did you see? What did you measure in your experiment? What results resulted? What data resulted? Did you have, uh, so you'll be describing qualitative data? Okay. This is a documentation of all relevant results. Let me circle the word all, all, and let me underline the word relevant, all relevant, 
Anything that's important will be described in the results section. All right, that is to say all qualitative information, things that can be described without numbers, and all of the quantitative information and statistical information. Anything that has numbers in them, you'll be placing in your results or data section. But if you see something change color or change size or change something that can't be quantified, you'll be describing it nonetheless. That will be, those will be qualitative data. Importantly here, I'm going to underline this, a lot of times my students forget this part. If we collect data and put it in a data table, they'll give me the data table, but they won't explain the data table in written form. They won't explain the data table or their graph or their chart in a paragraph. That's important in a results section, because as a reader, I don't necessarily want to have to interpret your graph, or I don't want to have to interpret your data table. I should be able to read it like a story. All right, read it as a paragraph. So your results need to be described in paragraph form and graphically, using graphical representations. So you're going to be graphing your results or in, uh, put it in, putting it in some way that visually represents the data that you uh, generated. All right? If you can look at your data, read it, understand it, uh, and you're, you've uh, included all relevant data and all relevant results, then you're ready to move on to the next section. And that next section is your conclusion or your discussion section. So let's compare, let's uh, quickly differentiate the results section and the conclusion section. Your results section is what did you see? Right? All you're telling me is what you saw. You're not describe. You're not explaining it. You're not interpreting what you saw. You're not telling me what every what those results mean biologically. You're just literally a reporter. You 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 write what you see and no more in your results section. In your conclusion section, however, you are interpreting your data. You are describing any trends. All right. You'll say as something as your x-axis increased our y-axis increased all right you'll see a trend in the data you see at every other time or after uh, a half of a minute or so we began to see exponential growth okay uh, we will be describing trends but more importantly you'll be interpreting those trends okay you'll be telling me what was significant about the trend what was insignificant about the trend, uh, statistically or not statistically. You'll be explaining why biologically or scientifically those trends existed. Tell me why. And that uh, your explanations should probably use info from your background information. Uh, that is to say, from your intro. Oops, intro. Okay, so the, your explanations should uh, be validations of what you anticipated, really. Okay, and so that is part of the uh, d uh, data interpretation of your conclusion section. Secondly, or thirdly rather, you're going to be analyzing the validity of your hypothesis. So that is to say you will be accepting your hypothesis. Your hypothesis may have been right, probably should have been right, but, but maybe they were wrong. Um, maybe you w had predicted something but didn't in, uh, involve uh, an important piece of the puzzle. In this instance, you would reject uh, your hypothesis and offer reasons why uh, you had to reject your hypothesis. Finally, the last part of your, oops, excuse me, the last part of your uh, conclusion section would be the future implications. What new questions? As I mentioned before in the introduction section and even in the conclusion section, um, you're going to be using information that you didn't generate. You didn't discover osmosis. You didn't discover the cell. You didn't discover 
photosynthesis, and you didn't write a book on it, and you didn't publish a paper on it, and you didn't uh, submit that paper to a journal, uh, a peer-reviewed journal that is read by other scientists. You didn't do those things. You read those things in a book, and that's how you learned about them. As a result, you have to give credit to the people who did discover those things, uh, who did uncover those kinds of biological content knowledge. You do so using references. Okay? Uh, and we'll, we will be references, we'll, we will be uh, writing references inside our paper. That is to say, we will be using in text or internal or parenthetical citations in your paper. And we will have full citations at the end of your paper, at the end of your lab report. That will be the fifth and final section of your lab report. What I want to do quickly right now is to go over how to go about citing things internally and citing things as a full citation at the end of the document. But the rule of thumb is this. If you know something, that is to say, if you read something about it, if we learned about it in class, unless you wrote a book on it, oh, there we go again, sorry. Unless you wrote a book on it, or you published a paper about it, or you presented to a group of uh, other scientists at a college or university, uh, it, if you haven't done that, it needs to be cited. Okay, So if you make any statement uh, that, about something that you know, unless you discovered it, you need to cite it. Okay, That's our rule of thumb. So let's quickly take a look at uh, how to cite things at the end of your document. That is to say, how to make full citations. Okay, so there uh, might be, as you might have uh, remembered from your English class, there are different ways of citing different kinds of documents. Unlike your English class, we're not using MLA format. We're not doing so. We're going to be using what's known as APA, which oftentimes is used in sciences. Uh, I've also become familiar with uh, AAA, which the, this third A, or second A stands for anthropology. Sometimes in chemistry, you might uh, look at the American Chemical Society, and they have their own way of citing things. But we're right to, in this class, for our purposes, we're going to be citing using the APA, the American Psychological Association's uh, formatting for, uh, for citations. If your citation is a book, like your textbook, you'll be including the last name, uh, uh, the initials of the first name of the author, the year it was published, notice it's in parentheses, uh, the title of the book, the city it was published in, the state it was published in, and the publishing company. Please also note all of the punctuation. The punctuation is just to, to be uh, replicated the way I've replicated it. Okay? So, for example, here's our book. Uh, for example, it could be uh, Tracy Kidder in 1981, or T. Kidder in 1981, wrote The Soul of a New Machine. Uh, that was published in Boston, Massachusetts. And the publishing company was called Little Brown and Company. All right, that's what would uh, you would place at the end of your document. All right. If you were using a website or any of my slideshow presentations, for example, which will be po uh, published or posted online, then you're going to use a different kind of format. All right, that format will be your website title. Okay. So, for example, if it's my website, you might say uh, AP Biology. The year it was published, which is the current year. Oops, that's not the current year. This is the current year. Uh, the article or section title. That is to say, what is the title of the, the actual page you're looking at? Not the general web page, but the specific page. The date of what, uh, when you viewed it. And then you'd say from and give me the URL. www.website.com Or, uh, or, or, not or, but uh, here is an actual example of a website that has been cited correctly. All right, our National Renewable Energy Laboratory is the uh, name of the general overall site. Uh, it was published in 2008. This actual page that we looked at was called Biofuels. It was retrieved or, or viewed at, on May, 8, or excuse me, May 6th, 2008, and it was uh, coming from this URL. All righty. So that's how we cite things uh, with full citations at the end of the document. But in order for me, as a reader, to know when you cited those things, or when in your paper 
uh, you are referencing from a particular website or book. You need to cite things internally. So for example, if I'm writing about something, I might refer to some kind of author's idea. I didn't come up with the idea, but I'm talking about maybe uh, the theory on bound and rationality. Or maybe I'm talking about evolutionary theory, or maybe the uh, theory of natural selection. Maybe I'm talking about osmosis. Maybe I'm talking about cellular respiration. Maybe I'm talking about a particular signal transduction pathway in a cell. I didn't come up with those. I didn't discover those, but I read about them, and I have to give credit to them. And so I'm going to do so in uh, internally or parenthetically. So the, what we say here is the last name of the author and the year of pub publication are inserted in the text at the ap appropriate point. And the appropriate point is at, towards the end of the sentence or at the end of the idea in parentheses with the last name, comma, year it was published, end parentheses. And then you'd actually add a, excuse me, a period at the end uh, if it was the end of a sentence or if it wasn't the end of a sentence you'd continue writing and then add your period somewhere else. Um, for, uh, however, sometimes you might refer to the author um, without having to uh, include uh, parentheses. So you might say something like, in, uh, if the name of the author or the date uh, appears as a part of the narrative, cite only missing information in parentheses. So you might say, as Simon posited in his theory on bounded rationality, but right after Simon you'd include the date that he posited this whenever that paper or that book was published. So as Simon, 1945, so you're saying uh, when Simon posited this it was 1945. So as Simon posited in his theory on bounded rationality, so on and so forth, you'd move on and add and end your sentence. This is how we cite things internally or parenthetically. Uh, we've talked a lot about the uh, different aspects of a lab report, but it means little if we can't actually see uh, a, a well-written lab report. So what I'm going to do is next to uh, this video lecture, I'm going to give you a link uh, to a particularly well-written uh, lab report from one of my students last year. And you will be able to see uh, all of the aspects of what we've just talked about in, in the title, the introduction, the materials and methods section, the results, the conclusion, and all of the references internally and at the end of the document. Okay, so uh, what I'm expecting now is for you to take a look at that document. Uh, please make note of all of the things he, this student did well, and I anticipate that that will be a great model for you uh, as you write your own lab reports. All right? So take care, guys.